framework of Bible prophecy. And our first session is announced from the foundation of the world, which is really about the question of how did Eden's edict here in Genesis chapter 3 establish what we might consider to be the vital framework of Bible prophecy itself. And that's what we hope to outline in substantive detail in our first two sessions this afternoon. But leaving the way completely free for our brother Don to then later update us on what's going on in the world at large in more detail, and I will be careful, therefore, not to tread upon uh, his territory. Now, we all know, brothers and sisters, that from the beginning, God's purpose was centered on filling the earth with his glory, a multitude of mighty ones, every one of whom would be made immortal and a perfect manifestation of the character of the Father himself. And that purpose has never changed, has it, down through time. That's always been the Father's purpose, to fill the earth with himself. But at the foundation of the world, and we know that that's a New Testament description of those epoch-making events in Genesis 1 to 3, at that foundation of the world, a rival system of thinking was introduced that challenged the supremacy of God. And it set the scene for everything that would follow, everything that would unfold subsequently in the divine record. And once that rivalry had begun, it would become the all-pervading theme of Scripture itself. And what the Bible really does is it documents the conflict between those two ways until the purpose of God finally triumphs. Now, just notice it here in Genesis chapter 3, if you've still got your Bibles open to that page. In Genesis 3.15, the record says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. And some of you will know that the Revised Standard Version and Green's Literal and Rodham's and others translates that phrase, not it shall bruise thy head, but he shall bruise thy head, which really more correctly follows the dynamic of the statement as a whole. Because now it reads, he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And we call this passage, do we not, the promise in Eden. And so it was. But it was something more than that. It was something more than, a, than simply a promise. It was actually a prophecy. Do you notice the future terms? I will put enmity. He shall. Thou shalt. So this was a prophecy. Genesis 3.15 is a prophecy. It's actually the first prophecy in the Bible. And if we were to ask, what was it about? The answer is it concerns the perpetual enmity between the two seeds. The word seed here, incidentally, zira, means literally offspring. So the whole world, according to God's perspective, the whole world is divided into just two classes, which happen to be hostile to each other. And the enmity that existed between them would not be extinguished until the one triumphs over the other. And when did this prophecy occur? Well, as we've said, at the foundation of the world, a time when God laid the foundations of all that would follow, including the foundation of Bible prophecy itself. And did you notice what it says, verse 15? <coughs> I will put enmity. This was God's controversy. And now the whole of Scripture from Genesis 3 verse 15 onwards will reverberate to the sound of that conflict and its ultimate resolution. This is the great controversy of Scripture. Now, there are two observations to make with regard to the implications of that prophecy in Genesis 3.15. I think the first thing for us to think about is that you cannot have conflict if one of those two seeds is absent. The enmity occurs between the two seeds. And what that infers is that the blue line, the seed of the woman, has therefore always existed somewhere in the earth down through time. That's a fascinating thought in itself. And I think the second idea is that the triumph of the seed of the woman over the seed of the serpent, the blue line over the red line, doesn't actually occur, does it, at the return of Christ? 
because the war between the two seeds will continue throughout the kingdom age. Oh, yes, the blue line will be in the ascendancy. Christ will reign. But the red line hasn't been extinguished, has it? Not until the end of the thousand years. And only after the little season of Revelation 20, verse 3, will the serpent power finally be vanquished. And only then will the blue line, the line of the seed of the woman, be triumphant in all the earth to the glory of God the Father. And that story, therefore, in the sweep of Bible history that chronicles the contest between the two seeds, that's what these two studies are all about, the framework of Bible prophecy. And what we're going to discover, and you know, brothers and sisters, as we trace these ideas this afternoon, I know that you already know most of these things. But we're reminding ourselves, we're going back to the center of what we've already known and believed and understood because it's good for us to be reminded. It brings us greater clarity of thought and therefore also greater clarity of behavior. So we say, we say that the result of that conflict that began in Genesis chapter 3 was that these two seeds are actually represented as being in mortal conflict, the one over against the other. And scripture certainly speaks that way. It talks of two seeds. It talks of two ways. It talks of two women. It talks of two trees. It talks of two houses. It talks of two masters. It talks of two cities. It talks of two communities. The Bible is redolent with this idea of the one over against the other. The controversy between the two. And just as with those expressions, what about these ones? Because the Bible also speaks about the spirit versus the flesh, about truth versus error, about above versus beneath, about holy versus unholy, about wise versus foolish, about light versus darkness, about good versus evil, about life versus death. Now, isn't that the story of the two seeds? Right through the Bible. And the enmity between the two. These are just different ways of expressing, in different words, that same conflict between the two seeds. And I think that the Spirit uses this variety of language in order to reinforce and to restate that same controversy. It's the same conflict, but expressed in a variety of terms, so that we might see it wherever we travel through the divine record. It, it, it comes before our presence and our notice. It's an identical conflict, even though it might be expressed in different terms. Now, let's just take one of those things as an example. So take the word here, enmity, in Genesis 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between thee, the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. Isn't that really what Romans 8 is saying in verses 6 and 7? For the minding of the flesh is death, but the minding of the spirit is life and peace, because the minding of the flesh is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. So here, instead of seed of serpent, we've got the word flesh, and instead of the seed of the woman, we've got the word spirit, but it's the same controversy, isn't it? It's just other language to describe that same enmity. Well, here it is again in Galatians chapter 5. Walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary. These are opposed to each other. Now, we could take every one of these equivalent phrases, light versus darkness, good versus evil, and we could trace it through Scripture to find the many parts and the many ways in which the deity has outlined this struggle. But it tells us that this is the quintessential controversy of the Bible, through and through, down through the ages, down through the Scriptures. It's the continuous theme of Scripture. And resolved into its essential details, We've got simply the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. And what that really means is we've got the thinking of the spirit as opposed to the thinking of the flesh. And the seed of the woman represents the light of the truth, but the seed of the serpent represents the darkness of error. So this is the great theme of Scripture, but it's also going to become the basis, we suggest, upon which the whole framework of Bible prophecy will also be established. 
Now, let me just illustrate that from uh, two simple Bible passages placed side by side in our minds. Now, you're already in the first one, so let's read Genesis chapter 3 again and verses 13 to 15. Yahweh Elohim said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And Yahweh Elohim said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now I want you to notice for a moment all the key ideas here. We've got a woman, we've got the serpent, we've got the seed of the woman, we've got the seed of the serpent, we've got the enmity between the two. And where are we in the scriptural record? Right at the start, in the book of Genesis. So now come right to the end, to the book of Revelation. And when we come to the end of the Bible, to the book of Revelation, notice what we discover in, for example, the language of Revelation chapter 12. We started at the beginning, we come to the end. And now the record says this in Revelation chapter 12 and reading from verse 15 to the end, 15 to 17. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood, after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon, the serpent, cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So what have we got in Revelation? We've got the woman, we've got the serpent, we've got a seed, we've got a war. Now, where do all those terms come from, brothers and sisters? Where do they all come from? Well, they're all out of Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, are they not? Would you say this is one continuous theme of Bible prophecy from Genesis to Revelation? Oh, yes, I think so. In fact, the phrase, the remnant of the woman's seed, verse 17, I think that phrase tells us that her seed that was there right at the beginning in Genesis has survived all the way down to Revelation. It's there, and the conflict between the, stu the two still exists, according to Revelation chapter 12. And I think what we're being told is this, that the story that began in Genesis is exactly the same story, the same controversy, the same conflict, the same enmity that will finally be resolved when all things are finished. That's what the book of Revelation is going to tell us, that God's purpose and God's principles have never changed. So when we talk about the two seeds as being the continuous theme of Scripture, I think we have good biblical evidence for saying that thus it is so. And that very term, when you think about it, the continuous theme of Scripture, don't you think that's significant as well? Because you see, the continuous theme of Scripture is the very reason why we hold to the continuous interpretation of prophecy. Because prophecy is just the unfolding of the central theme of God's purpose. And if that theme is continuous, then so is prophecy. Now, it didn't take long before the two seeds mentioned back in Genesis 3 had developed into two rival systems in conflict. Because well, if you come back to the book of Genesis, just notice what it says now in Genesis chapter 10. What we're going to be shown in Genesis chapter 10 and onwards is that the two seeds first revealed in chapter 3 are already developing into something more significant and more substantive. So Genesis 10 verse 8 says, Cush begat Nimrod, he began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before Yahweh, wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before Yahweh, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erech and Akkad and Kalna in the land of Shinar. The margin, of course, for Babel says Babylon. So actually what we're being told in Genesis chapter 10 is that the seed of the serpent has now already concentrated their power into a city and a kingdom, 
and for that matter, incidentally, a priesthood and a religion, which are going to be referred to in Genesis chapter 11, because that mysterious building of a tower whose top may reach into heaven wasn't just a tower, it was a place of worship, it was a place where the seed of the serpent would gather for their rival system of worship, led by none other than the Nimrod of this Genesis chapter 10. And you'll know, some of you will know that Genesis 10 verse 10 is the first time that the word kingdom is ever found in the Bible. And it's not the kingdom of God. It's the kingdom of men. It's the counterfeit of the truth. And it's all based in Babylon, says the record. That's the evidence of Genesis chapter 10. So before we come just a few chapters on from the Garden of Eden, we've already got a rival system established, thoroughly established, the seed of the serpent community, organized along political and religious lines. And now consider the other line, if you come to Genesis chapter 14. Do you remember what it says this? An interesting expression actually in Genesis 14 when we're told concerning Melchizedek in verse 18 of Genesis 14, the record says this. Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thine hand. Question. Who was at the head of this invasion that Abraham went against? Now, I know what most of us would say. If you weren't allowed to turn back, you'd say, uh, wasn't that Kedor Laoma? Well, yes, but see what chapter 14, verse 1 says in terms of who really was at the head. And it came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Ooh, Shinar, verse 1. Now, who actually began the kingdom of men in Shinar? This is the Nimrudian system, is it not? This is the seed of the serpent community. That's who Abraham's come against. So do you think that that community led by Amraphel, king of Shinar, do you think that they might be considered as not only the enemies of Abraham, but the enemies of Melchizedek? Oh, yes, I think so, because he's the king of the blue line in Salem, is he not? And so the seed of the serpent power centered in Shinar in the kingdom of Babylon is the enemy of the king priest in Salem of the seed of the woman community. And there's an enmity between the two. And so what it says in verse 20 is that Abraham gave Melchizedek tithes. And by giving him tithes of his battle victory, he bound Melchizedek into the victory against Shinar, the seed of the woman versus the seed of the serpent. That's what this is all about. So now we have two cities, two kingdoms, two kings, two priests. And just as Melchizedek was the king priest and head of the seed of the woman community, so Nimrod was famous for being both king and priest of the rival system of worship which he'd established. So the blue line, red line divide has already expanded into a full controversy that pits Babylon against Israel. We've only got to Genesis 14. We've only got as far as Genesis 14 in the divine narrative in terms of that controversy being clear in the earth. That's what Bible prophecy is all about. And the enmity between these two seeds is now going to become actually an enmity that we might rightly describe as Babylon versus Israel. Babylon versus Israel. And now come to the very end of the book. Because if you come to the end of the book in Revelation chapter 18, isn't it interesting or helpful that as we come from the beginning to the end, we see that consistent pattern emerging that tells us that we've got a framework here that lasts down through the entirety of the biblical record itself. And so we're told this in Revelation 18 and verse 21. And I just draw your attention to one key phrase. Revelation 18 verse 21 says... And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city, Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. The great city, Babylon. And now come to Revelation chapter 21, just a couple of pages over, one page over actually, and in verse 10. 
And the record says, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, which is, of course, the holy Jerusalem, if I can get my machine to behave. And so what we've got here are two great cities. The one great city, which is Babylon and Revelation 18, and the other great city, which is Jerusalem, representing Israel in Revelation chapter 21. It's the same conflict, brothers and sisters. And so the one great city is thrown down that it might be forever extinguished, and the other great city descends from God that it might be forever established. That's part of the framework of Bible prophecy in its sheer simplicity, but from the beginning to the end of the biblical record. And it's more than that, because actually, in addition to those rival systems, it's very clear from Scripture that each of those systems had what we might describe as a champion. They were led by two champions. So Nimrod was the king and the priest of the Babylonish rites of worship, and Melchizedek was going to be the king priest of Salem who led the true worship of God. So in this controversy between Babylon and Israel, in ancient times, in primitive times, we believe that Nimrod versus Shem was the basis of the conflict. Now, it's not time or place for us to consider whether Melchizedek was Shem this afternoon, brothers and sisters. I'm of the view that Brother Thomas was correct for a number of reasons. But the main point here is that the scripture presents two kings in rival opposition who are alive at the same time, leading those two different systems. In fact, it was a conflict between them, which led, we believe, to Shem having Nimrod judicially put to death. That Shem, Shem ordered the execution of Nimrod. Now, that's not part of biblical history, but it is part of the history of ancient times. That Shem would not tolerate the system of apostasy that Nimrod had devised. Now, when we come to the time of the end and to the final overthrow, when our Lord Jesus Christ returns, what do we have? Now, we shan't turn it up because we may look at it later, but you'll know in the second of Thessalonians chapter 2, we've got the man of sin versus the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And the man of sin of the second of Thessalonians inherits the mantle of Nimrod. And our Lord Jesus Christ on his return inherits the mantle of Shem. And the second of Thessalonians chapter 2 tells us that our Lord will judicially execute the man of sin in the same way that Nimrod was overthrown in ancient times. And the final conflict will be between two systems and also their respective champions. So based on the system of Bible prophecy that we believe in, brothers and sisters, we believe that we're looking for a rival system with power vested in one man, just as it was in the days of Nimrod. That's part of what our biblical expectations would be, which immediately incidentally suggests that the notion of the Arabs who have multiple mullahs and multiple teachers uh, is not, cannot be that Babylonian system at the time of the end. I think it's helpful also in thinking about those two ways, those two sides, is to think about another aspect of this, and that is that the words Israel and Babylon, we suggest, are proxy terms. Now, what do we mean by a proxy term? It's a term that is like an equivalent expression that stands for something else in a meaningful way, because each of these terms, Babylon and Israel, Israel and Babylon, represent a certain class down through time. Now, one of the alternative viewpoints that circulated on the Brotherhood, less so now, but maybe a lot more 30 or 40 years ago, is that God's purpose is centered on Israel and that the great focus of end time prophecy concerns the Jewish Arab controversy. Now, the problem is that sounds right, doesn't it, brothers and sisters? But it, it, it's not quite as right as it seems. In fact, a little further thought tells us that it can't be right. Because those who advocate in that context of the Jewish-Arab controversy, those who advocate that God's purpose revolves around Israel, what they really mean is that God's purpose revolves around the nation of Israel. And that's not, in fact, quite correct. 
because God's purpose from the beginning was to create a company of people in whom he could be manifested. And that promise and that intention predates the nation of Israel and predates the promises made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that immediately confirms for us that the blue line is not just the nation of Israel. It represents something more fundamental, a more ancient division, an earlier division. The blue line represents the seed of the woman down through time. Now, does that include the nation of Israel? Yes, of course it does. Is Israel primary to the fulfillment of God's purpose? Yes, of course they are. But Israel as a proxy term for the seed of the woman conveys something greater and wider than simply the natural seed. And I think we can show that by looking at the passage of time. So between the dotted lines, imagine that that's a space of 2,000 years, and then another 2,000 years, and then another 2,000 years. So we've got 6,000 years here. Now just think about that in terms of the, of the statement or the assertion that God's purpose revolves around the nation of Israel. So if God's purpose was centered on the nation of Israel, what was happening in the 2,000 years before Abraham came? Was God's purpose working through Adam and Seth and Enoch and Methuselah and Lamech and Noah and Shem? Of course it was. For 2,000 years, God's purpose was at work before the nation of Israel ever came into existence. And the conflict between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent had been going on since Genesis 3. But there was no nation of Israel in that first epoch of 2,000 years. Now take the last 2,000 years on that screen. For most of that time, certainly after AD 70 and until 1948, there was again no nation of Israel. For most of that last 2,000 years, there's been no nation of Israel. Did God's purpose stop in AD 70 when the nation of Israel was scattered? Did, did, did divine prophecy cease at that time? No, of course not. Did the seed of the woman continue on through the calling of the Gentiles? Yes, it did. Were they considered to be part of Israel? Yes, they were. But if God's purpose was really centered on the nation of Israel, why would there have been... 2,000 years of no nation of Israel, followed by 2,000 years of having the nation of Israel, followed by 2,000 years of having no nation of Israel, if the purpose of God revolved around the nation of Israel. That doesn't make sense, does it? But the moment we recognize Israel as a proxy term, an equivalent term for something wider than just the nation itself, to the seed of the woman down through time, it now makes perfect sense. And... Babylon as a proxy term for the seed of the serpent down through time will also be seen to be scripturally sound. And I think we can refine that thought a little further because I think that what we're really saying in terms of these two rival systems which are presented in scripture as clearly being in conflict, the one over against the other, that what we've really got is this. We have Israel, but we have an Israel that's described in the Old Testament record the people of God, the nation of Israel, as we've come to know it. But we might describe it as Israel phase one, the seed of the woman community in the Old Testament era. And likewise, as it turns out, we have scripturally the seed of the serpent in Old Testament times classified under that proxy term of Babylon as representative of that seed of the serpent community. And what we're suggesting is that when we come to the New Testament record, we'll find there's an Israel phase two. It's still Israel, but it's not the nation anymore, but it's still Israel. And likewise, there'll be another Babylon, which isn't ancient Babylon from Nimrudian times, but it's still Babylon. But it's Babylon phase two and Israel phase two. And that's exactly, we believe, how scripture actually represents the story between the two powers. Both Israel and Babylon have two phases, answering to the epochs of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The seed of the woman in the New Testament will, will reach out and turn to the Gentiles. But it will still be Israel. And the system of the seed of the serpent will move in the New Testament era to another location. But it will still be Babylon. The theatre of the conflict will change, but the rivalry will never change because the rivalry is continuous. 
That simple reality is why the conflict at the end can't be between the Jews and the Arabs, because there's absolutely no biblical evidence to ever demonstrate that the Arabs represent Babylon in Scripture. But there's copious evidence to show who Babylon really is as the Scriptures unfold. Or there might be some Arab powers, incidentally, that align themselves with the seat of the serpent community at the time of the, of the end. Some Arab nations that will fight with that Babylon grouping. But they're not Babylon themselves. And they never have been. You might be asking a very good question, which is, why that rather strange sort of um, wiggle in the middle of the screen? where the line appears to jump sideways and then carries on again. Well, that's a very primitive way of, of showing something that was significant in the purpose of the Father. Why? I think there are two stages, you see, in God's purpose. And that, that break in the line in the middle is suggestive of that moment in time. And if we were to say, well, why, why was there two stages? The answer is, well, because God's purpose was marked out by a stage that would be on either side of the coming of Christ. The events leading up to Christ and the events following away after from Christ, that would be the turning point in the unfolding of the framework of Bible prophecy, you see. And so that period of the changeover really pivoted on the manifestation of the Son of God as the true seed of the woman on whom the purpose of God rested. So we've got a sort of a dividing line in the middle of this where our Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene. And he sits right in the middle of this prophetic framework. And so there's a, a, piece, a piece of prophecy that sits before our Lord. And there's a section of Bible prophecy that follows on after our Lord. But he's intimately connected to this because he's the seed of the woman of Genesis chapter 3. In fact, if we were to ask that question, I think we can show that. So Babylon versus Israel. But Christ's part of the story. Of course, he has to be part of the story because he's the answer to the story. Now, think about that same question, and now read Genesis 3.15 again. Don't turn it back, but let me put it to you on screen. Don't you think that if this was the start of time up here, that that's when Almighty God said at the foundation of the world, I will put enmity between thee and the woman. And when our Lord came, in the middle of the story, as it were, isn't that when thou shalt bruise his heel came to pass. And when the Lord returns, won't the words, and he shall bruise thy head, shall be fulfilled. And so that whole framework hangs on the work of our Lord Jesus Christ, first intimated in the garden, but outworked into its triumphant conclusion at the time of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's all based on Genesis 3, don't you think? The framework of Bible prophecy. God's principles have never changed. His purpose has always been outworked in a manner consistent with this framework of thinking between the two seeds. And I think there's another way that we can demonstrate that as well, because if I was to ask you about the great prophecies of the Bible, I think we'd probably come to a conclusion, at least on two of them. But I'm going to suggest you a connection that you may or may not have seen before, which connect, I think, crucially the great prophecies of Scripture into the controversy between the two lines. Now, what's the great Old Testament prophecy that unfolds the prophetic record? And the answer, of course, is the prophecy of Daniel. And what's the great prophecy in the New Testament era which chronicles the same conflict? And of course, the answer is the prophecy of John, the book of Revelation. But I think that in between those two, we can place another prophecy. And that's the prophecy of Christ. Because when we look at the prophecy of Christ, the Olivet prophecy, we will find, not surprisingly, that our Lord quotes Daniel. He goes back to Daniel in his prophecy. And when you read the Olivet Prophecy carefully, you'll find that our Lord points forward to the book of Revelation. And the Lord's prophecy will be a bridge between the two. And all three will find their place in this framework as part of the continuous unfolding of Bible prophecy. 
And Almighty God ordained that thus it should be so, that the three great prophecies, as it were, of the scriptural record are all tied together on this framework, supporting each other, speaking to each other, explaining each other, until God's purpose is brought to its end. And there was another matter to notice about this framework, and that's this, that each of these two lines, each of these two seeds, were going to have two phases relating, as we've suggested broadly, to the Old Testament and New Testament epochs. And so what we've got is this. If you think about Israel for a start off, phase one, what I'm going to suggest to you is that Israel phase one obviously ended in AD 70 at the time of the overthrow of the Jewish Commonwealth. But when did Israel phase two begin? Well, when you think about it, Israel phase two began before AD 70, because let's say by about AD 30, the ecclesia of Christ had been established and the Israel of the New Testament record had already begun. So when AD 70 came to a a conclusion, as it were, that Israel phase one came to its end with the scattering of the Jewish people, Israel phase two had already begun. So there was no actual break in the line. The blue line carried on without interruption. There'd be an overlap, in fact, between the two. Well, I think the same thing happens in terms of Babylon phase one. Now, there's some date debate, incidentally, about when Babylon phase one comes to an end, and I can give you two alternative dates for that. The one is BC 323, when we believe that Alexander the Great dismantled the temple of Atemenenki in Babylon, which was the great temple of worship of the Babylonian system. He did that in 323. But in 293, Seleucus, the the Seleucid ruler of the time, he built Seleucus Nicanor, and he built Seleucus Nicanor in BC 293 a few years later, and he did it by taking all the stones from old Babylon and building it in Seleucia a few miles down the road. And at that stage, old Babylon was essentially deserted, and we can consider that Babylon phase one was terminated. But long before that, I've said here uh, a possible date of BC 333, which answers to Alexander arriving on the scene. But there's good evidence, in fact, that well before that, the Babylonian system of religion had already moved into Asia, out of Babylon and into Asia. There's, There's evidence that that may have occurred even in the time of Xerxes, a good 150 years before BC 333. And I've got a very interesting document by F.F. Bruce that shows that throughout the whole of Asia Minor in those days, B.C. 200, that it was riddled with Babylonist teaching and Babylonist religion right through the whole of Asia Minor. In fact, the kingdom of Pergamon in B.C. 282, it was full of Babylonist ritual. The Babylonist system had certainly migrated to Asia by that time. So the point is that even though Babylon itself was overthrown and whatever system of worship was there was overthrown, the actual mysteries of Babylon had already moved somewhere else so that they might continue. So what are we suggesting? Well, we're suggesting that although there might be successive phases, that the conflict between the two seeds, in fact, never stopped at all. There's always been a Babylon and there's always been an Israel. Because there's always been a seed of the serpent, and there's always been a seed of the woman. There might have been successive phases of each line, but the conflict itself has been continuous. The controversy between the blue line and the red line has continued unabated down through time. Well, it's all very well for me to say that on screen, with a few dates and a blue line and a red line, but we need some substantive scriptural evidence, don't we? So let's put together some scriptural thinking about that idea of how Israel phase one became Israel phase two and how Babylon phase one became Babylon phase two, (laughs) reasoned from a scriptural basis. Well, that brings us then to uh, some thinking thinking on, on that matter, the scriptural development of Israel down through time. Now, that time of transition for the blue line that culminated in the truth being taken to the Gentiles came, as we suggested, around about the same time that Israel phase one was going to be overthrown. And we do know that the overthrow of Israel phase one was a matter of Bible prophecy, was it not? Joel 2 said, 
I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Yahweh come. That's AD 70, isn't it? Joel chapter 2, AD 70. But it goes, carries on by saying, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of Yahweh shall be delivered, even in the remnant whom Yahweh shall call. And that remnant who would be called and saved were the Gentiles, as James expressly tells us in Acts chapter 15. And their calling would be coincident with the events surrounding AD 70. So at the very time that Joel said the Gentiles are going to be included, he also said the Jewish commonwealth is going to be overthrown. Those two events would be related. And when the Gentiles were asked to come into the truth. They weren't going to be accepted by God, were they, as a separate community from the Jews? No, their inclusion was based on the fact that they would be incorporated into the hope of Israel. And we have the warrant of the Lord's own prophecy for saying that, because that great transitional prophecy of the Lord, the Olivet prophecy, well, come and have a look at it in Luke chapter 21, because I think the Lord makes comment on that transition, the transition from Israel phase one to Israel phase two, which is exactly what the Lord should be commenting on if his prophecy is to bridge the story of Daniel to Revelation. He's going to talk about those transitional changes that would happen within the middle of the framework of Bible prophecy. Now, you see what it says in Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Now, we know this Bible passage well, brothers and sisters. We probably quoted it often in our Bible lectures. But I think what we're being told here, actually, is at the very time that Israel phase one were to be led away captive into all nations, verse 24, happened to be the very same time that the times of the Gentiles would begin. Question, what do you think that phrase means, the times of the Gentiles? What does it mean? Well, there are two Greek words for time. There's the word chronos, which means a specific interval of time. But there's also the word kairos that means a special or fixed occasion. Which word do you think the Lord uses here, chronos or kairos? Well, the word kairos not only means a special occasion, but has also been translated season and also opportunity. The kairos of the Gentiles. The opportunity of the Gentiles. Do you remember these words in Galatians 6 verse 10? As we therefore have opportunity, kairos, let us do good unto all men. Or Hebrews 11 verse 15, if they had been mindful of that country, they might have had opportunity, kairos, to have returned. So what was the season of opportunity for the Gentiles that Christ refers to here in Luke 21 verse 24? Well, it's the season that would come upon them at the very moment that Israel phase one was being removed. And the answer is that it was their time of opportunity to learn the truth and become part of Israel phase two until the opportunity of the Gentiles be fulfilled would be a better rendering of the Lord's words in Luke Luke 21 here in verse 24. And that word until, that little word until, does that take you to another Bible passage? Until, until. The margin refers us to the right place. Refers us to the book of Romans in chapter 11, to just come to Romans 11, which again we know, but notice the helpful connection now with the thinking of what the Lord said in Luke 21. So Romans 11 talks about, does it not, verse 17, natural branches being broken off, and verse 24, wild branches being grafted in, And then the apostle says this in verse 25, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. So the Gentiles were to be added to Israel and Christ's statement and Paul's statement are complementary. So the Lord said, until the opportunity of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And Paul says, until the fullness of the Gentiles be brought in. And when they are, says verse 26, 
And so all Israel shall be saved. And that phrase in the context now clearly embraces Gentiles as well as Jews who are now all counted as part of the Israel of God brought together. That's Israel phase two, don't you think? I think that's biblically sound, brothers and sisters, that Luke 21 and Romans chapter 11 tells us that before Israel phase one were overthrown, the opportunity of the Gentiles had already commenced that they might become part of Israel phase two. And interestingly, if you've got the same marginal references I've got against verse 25 of Romans 11, you'll find that it doesn't just cross refer us back to Luke 21, and rightly so, but also onwards to Revelation chapter 7. Now that's interesting because if you come and have a look at Revelation chapter 7, I think there's another line of thought here that is corroborative evidence for the thought of the Gentiles being made Israel phase 2. Because, well, this is what it says in Revelation chapter 7 and reading from verse 2. I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, the vision of Revelation chapter 7, concerns the spread of the truth in the New Testament era, and it relates to believers who are Gentiles. And yet, despite this, the fact that this is a sealing of Gentile believers, verse 4 describes the sealing this way. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and they were sealed in 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So 144,000, as we know, is 12,000 times 12,000, the community of Israel. And the only explanation really for that is that these Gentiles must be part of Israel phase two. And therefore, they're described this way. And so that's really the import of Revelation chapter 7, verses 2 to, two to 9, is that Gentiles sealed in this way become part of the tribes of Israel. And you'll know this, that the community of Gentiles referred to there in Revelation, aren't they the ones referred to in Ephesians chapter 2 when it says that they are now members of the commonwealth of Israel? Gentiles, members of the commonwealth of Israel. And one last reference in that context, if you come to Galatians chapter 16, and again, you might remember this little phrase, but it's significant in the context of, of what we're saying here, because in Revelation 6 and verse 16, the apostle says almost right at the end of his epistle to these Gentile believers, he says in verse 15 for connection, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace be on them and mercy and upon the Israel of God, he says. Ah, the Israel of God. This is a letter to Gentile believers. This letter is going to Gentiles in Galatia. But Paul describes them as the Israel of God. This is Israel phase two, is it not? Has to be Israel phase two. And one more passage while we're here. First to Peter chapter two. And again, if, if you're thinking the same way as I am. I know that as soon as I say First to Peter chapter 2, some of you will say, I know where he's going and I know where that comes from. Because where does it come from? Well, this is what it says, First to Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. The record says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, says Says, says, says Peter, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Now, where do all those terms come from? Well, we should know, although interestingly enough, the cross-reference isn't in our Bible margins, but it should be marked by us because it's at the other end. This is Exodus chapter 19, verses 3 to 6. Aren't all those terms, chosen generation, royal priesthood, holy nation, peculiar people? That's God's description of Israel, phase one, back in Exodus chapter 19. Now, incidentally, if you read Exodus 19, you'll find the margin says, see 1 Peter chapter 2. But when you come to the 1 Peter chapter 2, it doesn't say see Exodus 19. So you should get your pencils out and mark that in straight away, because that's what good Bible marking is. Always mark both ends of the stick. So Galatians 19, sorry, Exodus 19 verses 5 and 6 is where those words come from in, in the 1 Peter here. 
But these terms are being used to describe the Gentile Ecclesia of the New Testament. But they're described in the language that was used to describe the congregation of Israel in Old Testament times. Or did you notice that phrase at the end of verse 9, and Peter, while you're there, who that we might show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Do you know where that comes from? That's an allusion to Exodus chapter 10, verses 21 to 23. And it says this, And Yahweh said to Moses, Stretch out thine hand, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That ye may show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Come straight out of the story of Israel in Egypt as they were led out of bondage. But this is all being spoken to Gentiles in the first of Peter. Do you think we've got scriptural evidence, brothers and sisters, that Israel phase one was replaced by Israel phase two? I think so. I think we have good scriptural evidence that there was a continuation of the blue line seed of the woman community and that that's actually biblically reasoned in the New Testament itself, including the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what happened then in the red line seed of the serpent? Well, I think we've got similar biblical evidence to show that Babylon phase one also developed into Babylon phase two just as we've suggested happened with regard to the matter of Israel. So come and have a look at this in Daniel chapter 1. In Daniel chapter 1, we're told this at the start of the prophecy. It's all to do with connections of words, really. Little words can be so important. The record says in Daniel 1 verse, verse 1, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And Yahweh gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. So those words, the king of Babylon of the land of Shinar, who has a house of his God, those words take us all the way back to where? They take us back to Nimrod, Genesis chapter 10 and 11, and to the founding of his red line seat of the serpent kingdom of men, and the tower that worshipped in a counterfeit system of worship. And it's Genesis 10 verse 10 says, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babylon in the land of Shinar. So when it says here that Nebuchadnezzar took it all back, to his house of God, or the house of his God, Daniel 1 verse 2, that temple tower of Babel that was built in the land of Shinar by Nimrod is still standing in the days of Nebuchadnezzar, linking him directly to Babylon phase 1. Still there. But Belshazzar was warned, was he not, later in the book of Daniel, that his kingdom would be divided and given to the Persians, Babylon phase one was going to be overthrown. So it was. But it was going to be replaced by Babylon phase two. Now here's a passage which I think proves it. Because if you come to Zechariah chapter five, there's a famous prophecy in Zechariah chapter five, which uses a key word that takes us straight back to Daniel and for that matter straight back to Genesis. It jumps off the page once we see it, you see. In Zechariah chapter five, and reading a few verses just to piece the record together. Zechariah chapter 5, verse 7. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. Verse 8. And he said, this is wickedness, which is the woman he's referring to. And he cast her, says the revised version, he cast her into the midst of the ephah, and he laid, he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. Now verse 10, Then said I to the angel that talked with me, saying, Whither do these stalks bear the ephah? And he said unto me, All oh, listen to these words carefully. He said unto me, uh, Why to build her an house in the land of Shinar? And she shall be established and set there upon her own base. Now, by the time Zechariah received this vision, the power of Babylon had already been overthrown. 
And yet what he saw was a woman representative of a religious system who'd be taken away to another place. And that temple that was going to be built in Shinar, Zechariah chapter 5, is not the temple of Shinar in Daniel chapter 1. It's a completely different temple located in a different Shinar because it's based in a different Babylon. This temple was going to be part of Babylon phase 2. Another land of Shinar, another temple, another religious system. And so that phrase Shinar here tells us that there was going to be a Babylon phase two that replaced what previously had taken place in the city of Babylon itself. And it wasn't difficult to find out where Babylon phase two in the New Testament era might be centered. Because by the time of the New Testament epoch, the power of Rome was already being referred to as Babylon, a cipher, a code name, which was well understood. In fact, if you come to the first of Peter chapter 5, I understand that there are variant uh, views on the meaning of this verse, but personally I think it's quite plain. In the first of Peter chapter 5 and verse 13, the record says this, He says, verse 13, The ecclesia that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth marketh my son. She that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you. The ecclesia in that place. Now, it was highly unlikely that Peter was in ancient Babylon when he wrote. His epistle is a warning about the impending judgments that were going to fall in the days of the Roman Emperor Nero. That's what his book's about. And Eusebius says that his use of the term Babylon here was a cipher for the city of Rome where Peter was at the time. But he calls it Babylon. But it's Babylon phase two, you see. It's a code word for Babylon phase two. And if we're not sure that that's the case, brothers and sisters, we ought to be, because John uses the same code, doesn't he, in a passage that can't mean anything else other than the city of Rome, which is found in Revelation chapter 17. Because if you come to Revelation 17, John's going to use the same code word, but in a matter now that is unarguable concerning where that might be. Revelation chapter 17 says in verse 3, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast. And verse 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great. And then we're told these words in verse 9, Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Incidentally, did you, notice, did, you, did you notice the word sit, verse 3? Sitteth, verse 9. And again, then finally, in uh, verse 18, it says, The woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. And when John wrote, brothers and sisters, there was only one city which was upon seven hills, verse 9, which ruled the then known world, verse 18. And that city was Rome. But John calls it Babylon, verse 5. It's an unmistakable reference to the seat of Babylon, phase two. If you come to Jeremiah chapter 51, we're told what the ground of condemnation was that God brought against Babylon, phase one, the Babylon of the Old Testament epoch. When that original Babylon was overthrown and God's judgments came against them, here's two of the key reasons that God brought against them in condemnation. First of all, Jeremiah 51 verse 7 says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in Yahweh's hand that made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. So Babylon phase one was to be judged because of her spiritual doctrine that had corrupted the world. But if you come over the page to verse 49, she was also judged for this reason as Jeremiah 51 verse 49 says, as Babylon hath caused the slain of Israel to fall, so Babylon shall fall, the slain of all the, all the earth. So not only was Babylon phase one condemned for her doctrinal corruption, but because of her relentless persecution of Israel. 
Now come to the book of Revelation in chapter 17, that chapter we've just come from. Come back to Revelation 17 and just notice this connection. Revelation 17 says, verse 2, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Verse 4, she had a golden cup in her hand. And now verse 6, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. What were the two reasons why Babylon phase one was judged? her indoctrinating wine which corrupted the nations and her relentless persecution of Israel. For what reason do you think that Babylon phase two is finally judged? For her corrupting doctrine and the golden cup of wine and for her relentless persecution of the saints. So the spirit of Babylon phase two would be line for line the repetition of Babylon phase one. And Babylon phase two would be nothing more than the next stage of the seed of the serpent power and the perpetual enmity that it has against the seed of the woman, the blue line versus the red line down through time. And so it's not surprising, therefore, when it comes to the story of the overthrow of Babylon phase one, that we'll have a perfect counterpart in phase two. We shan't turn these up, brothers and sisters, but just listen to these words. Of Babylon phase one, it says in Jeremiah 51 verse six, flee out of the midst of Babylon, be not cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of Yahweh's vengeance. And now Babylon phase two, Revelation 18 verse four. And I hear another voice saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins. That's exactly the same. But that's Babylon phase two in Revelation 18 verse four. And again, Babylon phase one, Jeremiah 51. Forsake her and let us go, for her judgment reacheth unto heaven, says Jeremiah of Babylon phase one. But in Revelation 18, verse 5, it says, For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities, it says of Babylon phase 2. So what we've got, brothers and sisters, is a series of passages that tell us that the Babylon of Old Testament times was replaced by a Babylon of New Testament times in another house, in another city, in another Shinar, but it's still Babylon in terms of all its spirit and all its thinking and all its behavior. Why that exactitude of expression? Well, I think to show that Babylon phase two not only continues the sins of Babylon phase one, but will be judged in exactly the same way. Now, we don't know exactly when, brothers and sisters, the mysteries of Babylon phase one finally traveled to the city of Rome, but we know for certain that they arrived there. And that everything in the Roman Catholic system is an exact duplicate of Babylon phase one. The Roman Catholic worship of the mother and child is based on Semiramis and Tammuz from Babylon. The Roman Catholic use of the sign of the cross is the mystic letter Tau representing Tammuz, which comes from Babylon. The Roman Catholic vestments, including the papal keys, the papal mitre, the papal ring, the papal pallium, all come from the pagan mysteries of ancient Babylon. The Roman Catholic celibate priesthood comes from the celibate priests of Semiramis taken from Babylon. The celebration of the mass and the mystery of the wafer are all drawn from the pagan rituals originating in Babylon. Babylon phase two is an exact copy of Babylon phase one. So what we've got, brothers and sisters, and we ought to make no mistake about it, is that when we come to the time of the end, what we have is two rival systems in continuous conflict, one in the old, one in the new. But it's the same story of the red line versus the blue line down through time. So when we say that those two systems are in conflict, I think we've got the scriptural evidence to support that particular claim. And that rivalry, that enmity will reach its climax at the time of the end, when in the words of Daniel, all these things shall be finished. But that, God willing, is the subject of our next session. Thank you.